today for our third 100% virtual bridge meeting. I'm Arian Ravabach, Policy and Program Support Team Supervisor and the moderator for today's event. We are hosting this bridge meeting today using Google Meet, which we will be live streaming to YouTube. You can download the slides from today's presentation by clicking on the link displayed under the YouTube video. You may enter your questions for our presenters at any time into the chat box to the right of the YouTube video. If you're unable to log into YouTube for any reason to post your questions, please use your email to send us questions at rm.communications at nara.gov. As a friendly reminder, please keep the questions polite, professional, and relevant to today's discussions. If at any point you experience technical difficulties, please email that same email address, rm.communications at nara.gov, and a member of our production team will be happy to assist you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Lawrence Brewer, Chief Records Officer for the U.S. Government. Thank you, Arian. So good morning, everyone, uh, from the home recording studio. I hope you guys are all staying safe and healthy and enjoying this great fall weather, especially here on the East Coast. So it's been a crazy year, very challenging, and it's about to get even more challenging as we head into the holidays. So while I have your attention, if anyone has any ideas on how to do a COVID Thanksgiving with a large family, let me know offline. So before we get to the agenda and flip the slide, um, I have a few quick announcements uh, I wanna share with all of you. Um, first, staying on the COVID theme, um, this morning we posted an update to our COVID and RM FAQs that we initially posted in April. We made some recent changes to it to note that we are looking at the GRS to cover some of the records agencies are now creating that are COVID specific. So, some minor changes um, to the language in there. So I encourage you to take a look at it. And if you have any questions about the details of what's in the communication, um, please get in touch with the GRS team. Second, also related to COVID, I wanted to give you a heads up on the communication that we are going to be sending out tomorrow. We have been getting questions from some agencies asking us to do on-site appraisal work. And at this point, with NARA and most agencies in the early stages of reopening, we are not scheduling any in-person agency visits. So our focus right now is on doing this work safely, using the tools at our disposal to conduct this work virtually. So in tomorrow's communication, uh, you'll find further details on our approach. And we also are including some tips on how you can prepare for virtual meetings, for appraisal, and as we continue to work through this together. So if you have any questions about that communication, uh, I encourage you to get in touch with your appraisal archivist, um, and then we will be happy to discuss where we are. Finally, uh, just a quick update with some reporting news. As I'm sure you're aware, last month at the end of September, we published our annual records management report. I particularly wanna thank all of you for collecting the data and sending your reports in on time at, at really a time that was, I'm sure, inconvenient for, for all of us. So thank you for, uh, for, for doing that and getting us the data. But, you know, as you know, and I'm sure it's the same in your agencies as well, the work continues. So right now, we are already working on the templates and the questions that we're gonna be using for the reporting period next year. At this point, we expect the reporting window to run um, from January through March. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about that um, and the plans for reporting at our next bridge meeting in December. So if you have any questions on, on any of this, um, please send them in uh, at any time um, in the chat and we'll discuss in the general Q&A at the end of the meeting. So let's keep things moving and take a look at the agenda So we have a, a really good program, um, and you can see from the agenda, we have quite a bit to cover. So if we could go back one slide. Thank you. So uh, just wanna do a quick run through. First, we have uh, Gordon and Jeff that are going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with the FRCP. Then I will be back to talk to you about two bulletins. 
um, and then turn it over to Lisa, who will talk about transition, um, which is a, a big topic right now. And then we'll close the meeting with uh, a presentation on our cognitive technologies white paper, which we posted yesterday. So it's very timely. We'll have a chance to give you an overview of, of the content of that white paper. And then hopefully after that, we'll still have some time for some general Q&A and we can handle any chat questions that come in via chat. So with that, I will turn it back over to Arian. Thank you, Lawrence. This is a reminder to our viewers that if you weren't able to, if you're not able to ask your question in an individual Q and A session, we will have a, Q, a closeout Q and A session with all the presenters from today's program. Now, please welcome Gordon Everett and Jefferson Lunsford, who will pre be presenting an update on the FRCP program. Thank you, Arian. Good morning. I'm Gordon Everett, Director of the Customer Relationship Management uh, for the Federal Record Center program. And I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe uh, in our current environment. But as, as we continue to gradually and safely open the 18 federal record centers around the country, uh, you are able to get a, some real-time info uh, if you were to go to frc.gov and you click on operating status and it advises all of our uh, agency customers what phase each of the record centers are in. Uh, as of this morning, uh, we have uh, nine cent, eight, I'm sorry, eight centers in uh, phase one, nine in phase two, and one center is currently closed uh, due to the COVID metrics uh, in that county in Illinois. So please keep in mind that 10 to 20 percent of our staff are working uh, during limited hours in phase one and 25 to 50 percent of the staff are in those buildings doing phase two so and also customers before you send any records to any of those centers please make sure you communicate uh, with that, that record center uh, to see if they are able to accept records and what amount of records they're able to accept uh, safely uh, i know we have many in the uh, records management community on the line today but for our federal records officers uh, in a recent letter from our acting director of the Federal Records Center program, Stephanie Hutchins, uh, you received a letter from her with your interagency agreements for 2021. Uh, and you noted in that letter uh, is where we're establishing a new rate structure and billing timing to ensure the Federal Records Center program recovers all costs as required by law. So this morning with me is Jeff Lunsford, who is uh, the financial analyst from the Federal Records Center program, who will speak more about this. Yeah. Thanks, Gordon. Good morning to everybody on the call. Um, as Gordon mentioned, on, uh, in late September, uh, the interagency agreements were distributed to, our, to each of you. Um, it does reveal and does include news about the new fee structure for the Record Center program. Um, it's a, a major reorganization of our fees, um, and uh, we believe it will simplify and expedite um, the interagency agreement process as well as um, billing. So under the new structure, the fees for most standard services, including transfers, most types of dispositions, reference and refiles, are included as baseline services within the storage fee. Um, said another way, and to amplify that, there will not be a separate charge for reference, refiles, transfers, and most disposition. Um, the fees that will remain in effect and will be billed separately from storage um, include, but aren't limited to, truck service, labor rates, permanent withdrawals, um, and, and special projects like scanning and um, some consulting work. Um, so the fee structure uh, is, is in effect beginning October 1st, and uh, you should have a copy of those uh, 2021 rates um, that were attached to your inter interagency agreement. Um, we do want to point out and highlight that there is not a separate fee that's being charged for the disposal of records, and um, we hope that that will encourage the timely disposition of eligible records 
um, which will elevate the entire records management um, records lifecycle process. We have gotten a few questions, and what I did want to cover today, um, sort of the, the, the legal framework under which we can make these changes. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the enabling legislation for the Record Center program for the revolving fund. Um, it was included in Public Law 106-58 um, that was passed September 29th, 1999. Uh, that law actually is just the omnibus um, uh, appropriation uh, for FY2000. Um, but it included a, a little section that established the Record Center Revolving Fund, um, and it's codified actually in 44 USC Section 2901. Um, um, but the, the, in paragraph, um, let me look it up. In paragraph C, uh, the, there's a section about user charges, um, and it actually uh, was sort of its foundational legislation for us, um, and it, it, it was really written in um, a very uh, coherent and cognizant way in terms of how we um, would, would come to deliver services uh, in a reimbursable basis uh, to each of you. Um, so the, the legislation uh, indicates that, that we, we as, a, as, as a program and the revolving fund shall be credited with user charges um, from other federal accounts to cover our costs. Um, the payments um, can be made in advance or by way of reimbursement, and the rates charge will return the full expense of the operation. Um, that's, that's actually a, a really key sentence right there. Um, there is a law out there on the books that require us to charge rates um, to cover the full expenses of, of our program. Um, that includes not just salaries and rent, um, but it also includes accrued annual leave, depreciation, workers' comp, shelving, I mean, um, depreciation of IT systems and software. So, so truly, we um, are required by law to recover all of our costs through our fees, um, which is no small feat. Um, I do believe that as we combine our federal funding into a single consolidated program, um, it delivers value for all of the entire government um, because we are able to focus on our mission um, and relieve the responsibility of um, storing and servicing your own records. Um, another key uh, component of this legislation is in section D, in paragraph one under section D, um, it does require that, uh, require slash allow, it allows the record center program to retain up to 4% of our revenue in excess of our expenses as an operating reserve or to replace or acquire capital equipment. Um, that in a, a quick read, you might think that that sounds like profit. We're not actually allowed to make a profit. Um, all we can do is um, sort of create a budget so that we can um, maintain our equipment and keep our systems modern um, so that we can deliver high class services to you. Um, so that in essence means we are an at cost operation. There's, there's no profit involved. So it, the, those two sort of paragraphs within our opening within our enabling legislation require us to be exceptionally efficient. We have to cover all of our costs, but we can't charge you more than four percent over our, our our operational costs. Um, so the the new fee structure. I, I say all this to say the new fee structure is quite consistent um, with our enabling legislation and our practice for the last 20, 21 years, how long have been, 20 years? It's our 21st year. Um, so I guess we're, we're legal now. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we were very careful when we, when we uh, took a look at restructuring the rates to ensure that, um, again, we, the, the rates only cover our costs and do not, and, and, and we don't charge you any more than our cost. Um, so the other change you'll you'll notice, um, which hopefully is just sort of a, a an accounting change that that won't sort of shake anybody's world, is that um, we changed the the timing of our billing cycle so that our bills will um, 
will we'll be billing in advance as opposed to in arrears. So the October bill that you receive, you'll receive one, one, one bill in October that will close out September. So that's, that's all prior fiscal year. But beginning in October of FY21, the bill you receive in October will be for October. Um, so we'll be billing within that, the month that uh, services are being delivered. Um, and that, that uh, advanced billing, if that's what you, you want to call it, advanced billing will continue um, throughout the course of FY21 and beyond. So those are the, the, the two major changes that we've introduced um, with this interagency agreement cycle. Um, and with that, um, I think I can turn it back to Gordon um, and maybe open up the floor for questions. Okay, uh, Arian, do we have any uh, questions coming in? Yes, uh, we have uh, at least two questions uh, from the audience. The first question is, since the new rate structure is related to the COVID-19 pandemic, will the rates go back to the old structure once the pandemic is over? Jeff, I'd like you to take that. Okay. Um, we do anticipate that this will be a permanent change to our rate structure. Um, that is our intention. Um, it, it does offer um, a lot more um, freedom and flexibility in terms of um, not, not only our billing processes, but um, also it removes sort of any financial um, dynamic when it comes to making decisions about disposal or transfer or that sort of thing. It, it, it allows records, management, records managers to manage records without sort of um, the weight of um, finances. Um, so uh, we believe it's, it's, it's going to be a good thing for everybody. It will be, as we anticipate, a permanent change. And it's actually, in, in looking back through our history, it's um, consistent with the way the fund started. Back in 2000, we only had one rate, actually, and it was just sort of a, a box rate that included everything. So this, this sort of uh, tickles the back of my brain a little bit in terms of uh, coming full circle um, with, with the way we structure our rates. And one of the other things, too, is we also believe this will allow us to get um, our agreement information out to you much earlier um, than we historically have. So we think this will help. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Uh, the second question is, if most of the basic services are no longer being billed for, will we still be able to track the volume of requests Yes, there, there's a plan. Uh, when the customer sees their invoice, they still will see the number of requests and widgets uh, on the invoice. Uh, there'll just be a zero uh, dollar amount to that. So that information will still be kept. Okay, we have an, an additional question has come in uh, just asking for clarification. Did I hear correctly that no separate charges for destruction will be charged this year, formerly the D1 charge? That is correct. E effective as of October 1st, uh, all destruction October 1st moving forward is covered uh, under the storage charge now. So there will be no, there is no um, um, fee for destruction. It's covered in the storage cost. Thank you, Gordon. I don't, I, I don't see any further questions from the audience, uh, but a reminder, if you have any, please drop them in during the meeting and we'll, ask, we'll answer them at the general portion at the end. And, and Aaron, I'll, I would also ask uh, uh, if any customers there have any particular questions around that also, uh, they can get to their account managers or myself uh, and we'll uh, gladly follow up uh, on those questions around the uh, agreement and the rates. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you again, guys. Uh, now, please welcome Lawrence Brewer back to the to the presentation, as he will be presenting an update on NAR bulletins 2020-02 and 2020-01.
Thanks, Arian. And thanks, Karen. Um, I already got an email uh, on suggestions for how to do Thanksgiving. And uh, Karen, I see we're, we're thinking alike. Uh, I, I see that you're planning on doing it in the garage with outdoor space heaters. And, uh, you know, we may be going down that path as well. So if anybody has any other original ideas on how to get through the holidays safely, uh, send them on in. So at this point, though, let's not talk about uh, COVID and the holidays and focus on two bulletins that that we issued at the end of September. So we, we were working very hard to try and get um, both of these bulletins out before the end of the fiscal year so we could start the new year fresh with new guidance. So really happy to be able to talk to about talk to you about both of these today. So the first one we're going to talk about is NAR Bulletin 2020-02. Next slide, please. So you can see a few bullet points uh, on the slide about uh, what is covered in guidance on scheduling the early and late transfer of permanent records. This should look familiar to all of you as it supersedes what we used to call the 15 year bulletin that was covering early transfer. So that requirement still stands. However, what we've done in this bulletin is now included provisions for late transfer. So it's, it's essentially uh, we've got the bookends in place, 15 for early, 30 years for late. And this, the provisions for classified are, are still in place. So instead of 15 for classified, it would be 25. Um, and we have kept those provisions as well. One of the things that, that we also um, have kept in place uh, are the checklist for early transfer. And then we've added a checklist for you to fill out for a proposed late transfer. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward bulletin. Um, it includes our rationale for why we are uh, providing this guidance around both early and late transfer. Um, and again, the checklists are there um, for you to review the cases where you think an exception may be needed, and then you can get in touch with us via your appraisal archivist and review those specific situations. So again, fairly straightforward. Glad to get this out. I mean, this is one of the things that we wanted to, to make sure that we covered because while we had the, the early transfer, we didn't really have anything in place for late transfer. So we wanted to make sure we covered both ends. Next slide, please. So this is one that I know we've been promising for some time and I want to spend uh, quite a bit more time on this bulletin as we've had many questions about it. So next slide. As you can see, questions, questions, questions. And, and really what this gets to is when uh, the memorandum came out in 1921, back in June 2019, there was language in the memo that said that NARA would provide further guidance. So uh, we've been working on it and it's taken us some time to, to do the coordination, not only internally, but also with OMB. But one of the benefits in the time that it's taken us to get this out is that it really allowed us to hear more from you about what your questions are. So we were able to uh, fold those questions into this guidance that we issued last month just to make it that much more responsive to the questions and concerns that you have. So uh, really what we're trying to do, if we can go to the next slide, um, is cover a number of things in, in the bulletin. Um, we have uh, separated it out into four general categories, uh, some general questions that we received, um, some clarifications that, that agencies have requested. And then we focus quite a bit on the exception process and uh, not only what those exceptions must include, but the process for how to submit them. And then we address some questions that we've been hearing around uh, storage facilities and scheduling and transfer. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so um, I want to start with some of the general categories that are covered um, in the new guidance. Um, as I said, while the clarifications and the general questions are important, 
much of what is in the bulletin covers the exceptions that were uh, identified um, as uh, something that we would work on with this guidance um, related to M1921. So there are a lot of specifics in the bulletin, um, which I'll get to in a second. But going back to the M1921 memo, there were three general categories where agencies should first evaluate um, the impact of the memo on their compliance. Um, and these three categories are here, you know, whether or not complying with the bulletin and going fully electronic would impose a burden on the public on whether the cost of doing so uh, would exceed the benefit or if there was some statute regulation that would prohibit that transition from analog to fully electronic so those are general categories and then we start there and then move on to um, the specifics so we should be on um, slide 12, other considerations. Thank you. So in addition to the general categories that were in the memo, we added to um, the new bulletin some more specific categories. Um, one of the things that we felt was important and wasn't highlighted in the memo is that records with potentially intrinsic value is something that we wanted to have the ability to discuss with agencies. So, you know, we wouldn't want uh, an agency to digitize and dispose of historically valuable analog records um, without um, getting in touch with us. There's also more information in this bulletin about classified records and um, Obviously, we're going to need to deal with some of those issues on a, a case by case, but there's a general uh, placeholder in question that that just calls that out and, and um, highlights it as an issue that's something we're going to have to work through in some cases. And then fragile records where digitization is cost prohibitive. We heard that as a question where agencies may have some older records or uh, records on fragile media that would not be uh, appropriate for scanning or cost prohibitive to scan. So there are there are other areas where you know we we've heard those questions and we know there's going to be a need to have a conversation about how to move forward in those circumstances. Next slide, please. So let's talk process a little bit. Um, there's quite a bit in the bulletin that does get to what agencies need to do and how they should submit exceptions. One of the things that we are uh, asking agencies to do to the fullest extent possible is to develop a single comprehensive request. So we know that there are gonna be a number of requests coming in from agencies and we want to try and work through those as expeditiously as possible and i think it will be helpful not only for us but for you if agencies take the time to sort of pull them all together and submit them as one request so it, it's part uh part partly a reason to try and and keep things sort of focused and moving along but we also don't want to have to deal with you know onesies and twosies you know, as we go through the next couple of years. So we understand there's always gonna be exceptions to that and, and situations that are going to arise that you may not anticipate. We understand that, but to the greatest extent possible, we do want agencies to do one comprehensive request if possible. So one of the things that we also want agencies to sort of connect in these requests is how does the specific uh, request and the records that they relate to relate to sort of the strategic plan that the agency has in place for moving fully electronic. So we wanna try and connect the operational to the strategic, and hopefully that will be borne out in the reasons that agencies need to, um, to tell us about as they submit their request. And it should cover things like, um, and I'll get into a little bit more detail on this, but it should cover things like, you know, how long they need the exception for, um, and then any plans that an agency would need to come into full compliance. So uh, in terms of submitting, uh, we are saying in the bulletin that the request should be signed and submitted by the agency, senior agency official records management. And then we have set up 
a dedicated email box um, where you can submit uh, your request to us. Next slide. So in, in, in how you are thinking about submitting your request, I mean, we, we, we encourage you to think about how you would build a business case to support the exceptions that you need. So we said we want it to be comprehensive. We said we want it to be strategic, but we want it to, you know, have all of the factors that sort of underline the business needs for why you need to have this exception um, so that we can very, very clearly see and evaluate why it's important for you to, um, to get an exception to M1921. So there are a lot of elements that I'm sure are going to go into your business case. Um, we expect you to identify all of those elements and be able to connect them. And some of those things are on the slide that we will be looking to see in any request that you send us. Um, descriptive information, including the, the approved disposition authority for the records in question, the volume of the records that are affected, um, the costs that you are going to incur to digitize or provide reference. Um, and of course, if there are legal issues around ownership or access, uh, we would want to know that as well. And then the last one is an important point too, time estimates on how long an exception would be needed. And this is where we sort of get into that distinction between an exception and an extension. We have heard from a number of agencies where they have a plan to go fully electronic, but they can't get there by 2022. So they are telling us that, well, we can do what the memo requires, but we cannot get into full compliance until 2024, for example. So that's a situation where uh, we just need to understand and know the circumstances, uh, the, the plan, the project plan that you have in place to make this transition. And then reviewing, reviewing a request that's an extension is, in my view, a little bit more straightforward than reviewing an exception where something may be needed indefinitely. So if that is the case for a particular record series, please let us know. Give us your project plan. Let us know when you can be um, in full compliance. Next slide. So I did want to uh, close before talking a little bit about what NAR is going to do once we receive your request for an exception or an extension to the requirements in M1921. So there is a process involved. Um, obviously, we are going to review it internally. Um, it is going to be um, through internal NARA stakeholder units for their comment and their feedback, the custodial units who, um, who have a lot of information and knowledge about particular records. Um, and then we also do need to coordinate externally with OMB. Um, we haven't done this process before, so there's a lot of unknowns in terms of how this will play out. As I noted, we are going to work through requests um, as we receive them as expeditiously as we can. But at this point, we're not setting a time frame for how long it's going to take to resolve the requests because all the requests are going to be different. They're going to have their own levels of complexity. And we can't really predict how the coordination is going to go with OMB and how streamlined that process is going to work. So there's a, a number of factors that we need to figure out and work through the process a couple of times, and then we'll be able to provide more input and feedback back to agencies after we receive requests on how long we expect it to take. So at this point, we're kind of leaving it open um, and uh, working through it a, a bit, a few times and see how it goes, and then we should, be, should have a better handle on how this is gonna go going forward. One thing that I did wanna note is, um, the recommendations on whether to approve or deny um, a submitted exception um, ultimately comes down to not only OMB and, and the feedback that we provide to OMB, but also to the Archivist of the United States, who from NARS side of things will be the final decider on um, the ultimate disposition of an agency's exception request. 
So it is a uh, rigorous process where we are going to be working through this, not only internally with OMB, but also with all of you. And you should expect that we may have some questions and want to get back in touch with you um, to get further information and details as we review each request that we receive. So with that, I will pause and see if anyone has questions about either of the bulletins. Thank you, Lawrence. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, the first one, have there been any discussions in regards to the, having the 2022 deadline be extended? So there have not been any discussions yet, and we did address this in the new bulletin. One of the things that we have been saying all along is that right now we are all focused on COVID, making sure everybody is safe and healthy and um, in developing our agency plans on how to reopen and get people back in the buildings. And that really has taken the time and really the bandwidth of the senior managers in our agency and I'm sure in yours as well. So we have not yet, because of that and our focus on that issue, been able to have any discussions with, with OMB at this point. I can assure you that we will get there and we will have those discussions, but at this point with the deadline still two years away, we feel like we have some time to sort through it, get through the pressing need um, to keep people safe and reopen our buildings now, and then we can have those discussions. So I think uh, as you go forward, you should consider that as you're developing your request and assume that the targets are not going to be changed and then we can work with you on your request. And if they do get changed, then uh, perhaps if all you're requesting is a short extension could be OBE at that point. So I would say just stay tuned. We will get there. We will have those discussions. We're just not at that point right now. And thank you. And the, the other question sort of dovetails off your response there. Uh, shouldn't COVID-19, pan, the pandemic, be an exception? So the memo is about going fully electronic. And that goal, that target hasn't changed. We still, in spite of the, the, the pandemic, need to continue to the best ability that we have to work on moving fully electronic. Yeah, sure, COVID is going to affect that and it may, um, it may impact in certain circumstances our ability to digitize records or do the work that we need to do. So in those cases, that may be true, that COVID may be a reason why an agency needs an extension. So I think that is where I think agencies need to evaluate the difference between an exception and an extension. And I think in those cases, I could certainly see that as being a reason for needing more time to get the work done. But still, in order to request an extension, because we need to get through COVID, we still need to understand the plan, uh, the series of records that are gonna be affected by this extension and the details um, underlying it. So I think that is probably the best way to approach it. I think if you're looking for an exception, it's really, uh, immaterial from COVID, if, if it's the kind of, uh, you know, general uh, exception that we discussed earlier, COVID is not going to have that kind of impact. But for an extension, it may be something you need to talk to us about first, and then we can work together on uh, what will, you would need to submit to us for review. Any other questions, Arian? I don't see any coming in at this moment. As a reminder to our participants, you can ask your questions in the YouTube chat or you can email them to rm.communications at nara.gov. Okay, well then I will say you can uh, certainly uh, send in a chat and if we uh, have time at the end of the meeting, we can certainly take up your question then or uh, send an email to uh, RM Communications as you see on the slide um, and we'll be sure to get an answer back to you. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Aaron. Thank you, Lawrence. Now, please welcome Lisa Harrell-Lampis, the Director of Records Management Policy and Outreach, who will be presenting on transition 
and federal records management. Hi, thank you very much. So welcome everybody to this, uh, my portion of today's bridge meeting. I'd like to talk a little bit about transition and federal records management. So if we can go to the next slide, we will start at the beginning. So I always, um, I know that there are many members of our federal records management community that have been through transitions before and they sort of know the ropes. But I thought that for those of you who are new, who may be new to federal service and new to federal records management, we can start at the beginning and just cover a few basic things. Um, so bear with me if this is a repetition for you. So first I wanna talk about what is a presidential transition. It's words that may have been thrown around uh, quite frequently or you hear them in the news and we talk about transition. But I'd like to point out and talk about what it is specifically. It's the process for planning for a new presidential term. You'll also hear me use the words presidential tr transition or administration transition. The administration and presidential are, are synonyms because what we're talking about is the process of preparing for a new president to enter the office or for a president to start a second term. It really doesn't matter who is, wins the election because as far as we're thinking about it from a federal records management perspective, perspective there's always a transition. Every four years, there's a transition and it's something that we need to plan for and prepare for. I've also put on this slide, for those of you who want to uh, look at a little bit more information, I'm calling it my legal footnotes on the bottom. Um, there are laws that govern how a transition works. It's not something that we uh, make up every four years. Um, there's a process, there are uh, steps in place, and I could think that I would say from my 30 years of federal experience that I've watched each transition sort of get a little better and the reasonable, good, effective, and efficient government part of this process is always looking at ways to do transition a little bit better. And that is why you can see the laws have been updated from uh, 2000 to 2010, 2015, and even uh, 2019. One of the changes that happened in the past uh, 10 years is that to support transition, there is a, by law, a Center for Presidential Transition that is being run by the Partnership for Public Service, uh, or PPS. And for those of you in the federal space, uh, PPS might be ringing a bell. That is the same organization that runs the Employee, Value, uh, Employee Viewpoint Survey, the EVS, and the Best Places to Work in Government. They're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. And what their role is in transition is creating a Center for Presidential Transition and pulling together all sorts of sources of information and resources and being a place that can communicate and can focus on transition without having um, either of the parties or administrations having to um, focus on that from the perspective of their running campaigns. So you don't want to run for a campaign and perhaps focus on the administrative parts of a presidential transition. I'll also highlight, as I said, we're starting at the beginning. So if anybody is new to transition and they wanted to learn more about what transitions are like, I recommend going to their, uh, their website. because They have a wealth of resources. And in fact, on the next slide, slide 19, I've put a screenshot up of, the, um, of, the, of their website. As you can see, they're focused on information and resources for campaign teams, for transition teams, uh, for Congress and the media. And I would say if you're learned, this is a good resource. If you're new, this is a good resource to use to learn. And one of my favorites is not only do they have a blog, but they have a podcast. And I too have been listening to the podcast and just in general thinking about um, how transition works. So that's a resource for you. On the next slide, I'd like to um, talk about the legal requirements for agencies. So if you delve into the center's work or you delve into those laws, there are certain legal requirements that each agency and, and the White House need to do for transition. The first is that each agency must designate a senior career official in charge of transition um, planning, briefing, and succession planning. On September 4th, OMB issued a memo, which we all love our OMB memos. This is M2033, 
and it directs agencies to designate those career officials as the law requires. Um, it says that every agency must um, have this uh, designation, this person in place, and that includes every component agency for a department and even major subcomponents that they all need to have their transition fish, uh, officials by, by now. There also are two councils that are formed um, by law and supported by uh, the center. One is the White House Transition Coordinating Council, and the other is the Agency Transition Directors Council. And as I said, if you're interested in these councils or interested in more, there's resources for you to go look. But what I wanted to point out from this perspective for our federal community is that there are groups and there are people who have been working on transition. They've been actively uh, developing the succession plans and the, and the briefing books and thinking about how to do transition. And as part of their roles, they have been thinking about records management. Um, how do I know they've been thinking about records management? If we could go to the next slide, please. We'll come back to, I'll answer that question in a minute. Because what I wanted to talk about were not only the legal requirements that the PPS helps set up, but also NARA's responsibilities. So as an agency, we have three major responsibilities that come that are related to transition. The first one, which is really interesting, and I'm always uh, excited and interested to see what our colleagues are doing on the other, in another part of NARA, is that we're responsible for transferring presidential records from the White House before a new president is inaugurated. As you may know, NARA runs the presidential libraries, the presidential centers, and so like I said, that is a huge part of NARA's mission and very interesting, exciting, and unfortunately for you, not what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm also not going to be talking about item number three because we also are an agency and we have to prepare for transition just like every other agency does. We have our coordinator and we put together our plans. Although we are a very, um, as you know, NARA is a medium sized to small agency and we actually only have one political appointee. So we're, we're in good shape as far as uh, that goes. We're, we have a little bit of an easier path when it comes to preparation as an agency. And what I want to focus on today for this uh, bridge session is talking about that second point, that we have a responsibility to provide guidance and support to help ensure that incoming and outgoing officials follow federal records management requirements. We at the National Archives are one of the four support agencies that help support transition. Um, there are um, three other agencies as well. And those agencies are OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, which helps focus on um, you know, hiring and getting people in place. It also is the Office of Government Ethics, OGE. They are, OGE is responsible for helping incoming officials get through the ethics review and get through the vetting to do, um, to be confirmed in their appointments. And then the fourth agency, so OPM, OGE, NARA, and the fourth agency is GSA. And GSA, I would say, is the lead federal agency that helps work with the center and work with these councils and is supporting um, transition. Uh, they also have the role that GSA always has of sort of uh, finding places and finding things. So they are GSA. They help agency transition teams find space and agencies. They help make sure they have um, equipment that's necessary for, for transition support. So if we could go to the next page or the next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight and go uh, GSA's role and answer the question I just posed to ourself, ourselves a minute ago. How do agencies transition teams know that there are records management requirements? Well, GSA has put together a transition directory. Once again, this is a picture of a screenshot of a website, so you can go look at the center's webpage or you can go look at the GSA transition directory. When you get there, you'll see again a wealth of information relating to what federal agencies and transition teams need to know about transition. And you'll see that I have expanded their left-hand navigation to point out that in the directory, there are specific records management guidelines where we talk about federal records and presidential records and um, have resources available. So we know that agencies who are using the directory and the councils and the ATD directors are referred to this directory. And we know that we've sort of linked 
from the center site to the GSA site to NARS site to provide resources. So if we could go to slide 23, please. I'm gonna talk about what those resources are. And I wanted, I'm sorry, I did wanna also share, we are made these resources available and um, we have, and I and my team, we have both briefed the agency transition directors and we've been working with the partnership. So we know that the agency trend director, transition directors and those career officials who are supporting transition are getting their awareness of records management requirements. And we know we've been making this uh, awareness available for agencies as well. We have had on our webpage for a long time, a webpage we call Documenting Your Public Service. When we first developed these, this information, and I think we've been doing versions of this for the past 20 years, we had a guide that we would hand out to, for incoming officials that said, or made available for other agencies to hand out as a publication. Here's what you need to know about documenting your public service. So we've always left that on our webpage. And what is here is a series of resources to help agency records officers and federal records management staff be prepared and think about the things they need to cover for federal records management requirements um, during transition, because there's always areas of emphasis we want to focus on. I'll also point out on this page that we have a short, I think it's about a five or six minute video that we created in 2016, and it has the archivist talking about the importance of records management during transition. That's available if you want to use that in a, um, a a transition briefing. We have a video that we want to share. And if I were to give a short two sentence summary of why we're doing this work and what the uh, video is about, it's that every time there's a transition, we're making history. It's just the nature of transition. Something in you know is happening with the, within the federal government, either a one term or a two term president that makes history. And what do we do with the National Archives? We preserve history. So we are looking to work with agency records officers and transition staff to make sure that we have good, efficient, and effective governance structures in place so that the history that's made is captured and eventually comes to NARA. Okay, uh, let's talk about the next, uh, move on to the next slide, please. So while there are traditional records management activities that happen during uh, transitions, I wanted to bring up four areas of focus that we've sort of noticed trending over time and, and hopefully we have resources available that will help with those of these areas. So the first area of focus I wanna say is email. Email, email, email. I was going to say it takes about 100% of agency officials that um, are impacted by transition are capstone officials. But I'm, you know, there's always one little exception that proves the rule. So I'll just say 99.9% .9 of the times um, when you're talking about transition, you're talking about capstone officials being impacted or affected. And this is important for um, good records management so that when there are incoming officials uh, coming into um, federal service or outgoing officials, as they're getting their entrance and exit briefings, that they be clearly informed that their emails either have, are or will be um, uh, preserved, depending on how the agency's policy and practices are going for implementing uh, capstone policy within their agency. And I think the idea that email is historical, the idea that their email um, needs to be done on official business systems that um, you can, if you end up for whatever reason using a personal account to conduct official business, the policy does not forbid it, it strongly discourages, and the law says officials have 20 days to forward that to their um, official business accounts. So when would these in, uh, incoming officials learn about Capstone? Hopefully they'll learn about that during um, the entrance and exit briefings. The other area of focus for us are entrance and exit briefings. Um, we do have a resource, of course, on our, our webpage. We have some model checklists. We have found it's really important to brief incoming and it's really important to brief outgoing officials as soon as possible. Because sometimes uh, officials who are leaving will think that I'm going to take series of records with us. You know, I, I need this for my, my future career. And of course, 
as we all know, there are rules about records and record keeping. You can't take records, but you might be able to take some copies of some records if they are appropriate for release. So there's often a review period that has to happen through legal and through records to make sure that there's any outgoing records being taken by an outgoing official or either their personal papers, which they kept um, on in the government offices and systems, or they are uh, copies of non-records that are um, releasable under, under our records and FOIA rules. I'm also going to highlight the last two areas that are new, uh, new areas of focus. And by new, I mean we've really started focusing on them in the past 10 years, which is social media records and web records. I just want to point out that, you know, many social media accounts, they are considered to be uh, federal records, especially they may be copies or their social media accounts are used to amplify um, other records management or other briefing information. And we want to point out that social media accounts generally are used by agencies or stay with the agency. So outgoing officials, they, they lose their followers when they have to go back to setting up um, a new you know, Twitter account or a new social media, running a new blog that's related to their work once they leave um, federal service. And I'll also highlight that web records is an area that we're starting to pay more attention to when it comes to transitions, because often when there's a transition of an administration, and new officials come in, there will be a new emphasis on the web page. Maybe there's something that reflects a new organization or a new focus for that new term. And I just want to highlight that if web records are if web records are scheduled, they need to be um, managed and maintained for the um, as as according to record schedules, which often could mean. Uh, replacing information as it's needed, but then knowing that as an agency that you know what you had uh, on the website recently and making sure you've got web content in place so that you can um, know what was said in the past as well as what you're saying currently. And I'll mention these four areas are something that we're, we're focusing on and I'd like to highlight our Records Express blog. In our Records Express blog, we're doing a series of blog posts to go into these four areas a little, a little more. Um, we've, two of them have been sent out, two more may be coming over the next uh, week or two, as fast as Ari and I can, uh, can get them written and get them out. And so if you're looking for resources, you not only have the center's page, the transition directory page from GSA, NARA's documenting your public service page, you might also find the uh, Records Express blog is just written in a way to help focus on these areas and provide some more context for you. So with that, I'm going to close on my final slide because this is where I'm going to say, for those of you who said, yeah, 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 I've, I've tuned out a little bit because I don't really need to pay too much attention to um, transition until there is a election result and then we'll figure out what we really have to focus on. I wanted to share this um, slide which comes from the Partnership for Public Service. It comes from the center. One of the resources they made available was data on turnover rates for when a um, president goes into a two term, a second term. And here you can see um, the data for uh, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, and you'll see that once there was the election, um, they divided this up over, uh, over a nine-month period. How many cabinet officials resigned and transitioned between election day and inauguration day? How many um, left between um, inauguration of the first three months? And then again, how many, how much turnover there was between the three to six month term? So I'd like to say that records management, uh, records management never sleeps. Records management never stops. Um, we are working um, to make sure that we're prepared to save and preserve uh, permanent records created by senior executives. We're making sure that they know their responsibilities as they transition in or out of a position. And regardless of who wins the election, there's going to be turnover and there's going to be transition. So I hope these resources will uh, be available and help you um, as you are thinking through the ways to prepare or perhaps have already been preparing and are familiar with our work here. So with that, I'll ask if there are any other questions related to transition, anything I can help with. 
Sure, thank you, Lisa. We do have uh, at least one question. The first question is, my agent, agency currently does not have an agency records officer. How can our records management office know the process for helping our political appointees get their records handled before their departure? Would NARA give us some assistance since we are short-staffed? Well, for assistance, we'll do what we can. I'd like to ask that person to send an email af um, an email to me directly, or I'll follow up from the uh, records communications uh, email if you asked it that way, because we'd have to find out who is acting as records officer, and I could see if we could make some connections to the transition team that's in place at your component, and maybe we can make the right connections and make sure that um, the information, the briefings are getting to the right person at the right place. That's a great question, but one I don't have a, a general answer for. And I know we always have a little bit of a lag, so I will let the dog out of the office while we're thinking if there are any other questions. That's how you know this event is live and during COVID. Thank you, Lisa. I'm sure he appreciated that. At, at this point, we have no further questions. All right. Well, then, thank you. I know if you have any other specific issues or questions about transition and you don't find an answer in any of those resources, please feel free to reach out to our office and we'll be happy to, to help you any way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Now, please welcome Marcus Most, an archive specialist who will be discussing our new Cognitive Technologies white paper that we posted yesterday on Records Express. Thank you, Arian. I uh, wanted to take a couple of minutes this morning to talk to you about a Cognitive Technologies white paper uh, that just went up yesterday. Uh, next slide, please. This, uh, this paper uh, covers these four technologies. And uh, for purposes of this paper, we collectively refer to these four technologies as cognitive technologies. Um, we, uh, we cover not only the kind of the, the definitions of the technology, but also um, some of the supporting infrastructure that these technologies rely on. Um, and we also take a look at some of the cultural and society implications uh, with a focus on biases and ethics within the uh, artificial intelligence field. The audience for the white paper uh, includes records managers, appraisal archivists, and folks interested in the intersection of new technology and records. Um, the records management analysis uh, focuses obviously on records and data management, policy and standards, um, and really what the implications of, this tech, of these technologies are for appraisal, scheduling, and transfer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a quick snapshot of the definitions uh, to perhaps entice you into reading the paper. Um, IoT is really any device that has a microprocessor and can, and can communicate wirelessly. Uh, we have RPA and machine learning. And uh, artificial intelligence ends up being more of an umbrella term that covers algorithms, methods, or technologies that are, are employed to make a system behave like a human. Next slide, please. Uh, so you can find the white paper here. Uh, the paper was written by uh, Sharmila Bhatia and myself, and we also wrote it with Kyle Douglas, who's now over at the National Science Foundation. Um, and in this same section of the website, uh, there's also a white paper about uh, the records management implications of blockchain, uh, in case you're interested in that also. Uh, so that's really the quick snapshot of what we had. Um, Arian, are there any questions? Thank you, Marcus. We have not yet received any questions uh, from the audience, but if you have, again, if, if you have them, please leave them in the chat, or you can email them to rm.communications at nara.gov. So at this point, uh, we'll just move on to our general Q&A sessions with all the presenters from today's program. Uh, we do have a few questions that uh, have come in and we will make sure, uh, we'll circle around and get to those now. 
I'd like to start uh, with Gordon, please. Uh, we have a couple questions of, of, about the FRC and the FRC rates. The okay. first, where can we get a copy of the notice about FRC changes that was sent out in September? Uh, that was sent to records officers with their interagency agreement packages. Uh, I want to say September 29th. Uh, but they can reach out to their account manager. And if they, for some reason, didn't receive it, lost in the mail, if, if they'll reach out to their account manager, we'll get it resent to them. Okay, thank you. We have another, the, another question. If and or when NARA's 4% is exceeded, how or does NARA re return the excess to agencies? So I'll, I'll take ahead. that question, Gordon. Um, so the um, enabling legislation actually requires us, um, if we do exceed uh, that 4% revenue over expenses, we are required to return any excess to the Treasury, the, the sort of the United States Treasury, not the Treasury Department, but the big um, pot of money in the sky, uh, which serves to offset the national debt. Um, which I think is in the 20 to 25 trillion dollar range. I haven't, it's been a while since I checked. So if, uh, if you know, if, if we go over 4%, 4% right now is about $8 million. So if we hit 5%, that means we have an extra half million dollars. We're required to send that half million dollars to offset the $25 trillion debt. So it kind of <laughs> vanishes into thin air, but unfortunately there isn't um, a process by which we, we sort of divvy up the money and, and send it back to customers. Okay, thank you both. Uh, I think we'll move to Lawrence and some questions around the, the NARA bulletins. Uh, the first one is, must the exception request come from the department level SAORM or can it come from a bureau's ARO? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about the process and how it should work. And one of the things that we're, we're trying to do uh, with the bulletin is really try and make that connection tighter between the records officer and the SAORM. And in this particular case, we feel it is appropriate for exception requests to come from the senior agency official for records management because it relates to very important strategic initiatives and requirements that agencies are working on to transition to fully electronic government. So we understand that bureaucratically, this does present some additional challenges. And I think this is also an area where I think if you do spend the time at the operational level within the records management program, pulling together that comprehensive request, sending it to the same arm for a review and sign off, um, that should hopefully streamline things on your end. But at this point, we put it in the bulletin that way because we want to make sure that these discussions are elevated within agencies because they are most certainly going to be elevated within our agency and with OMD. So we wanted to make sure that connection is uh, leveled and parallel. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question that had come in, does the exception process shown on your slides apply to for agencies seeking an exception for closing their federal agency's record storage facility? So uh, short answer is yes. Um, the, the guidance that we issued um, should cover and is expected to cover any type of exception to M1921 that agencies would be requesting. And obviously there are requirements in M1921 that relate to uh, record storage, uh, agency operated record centers uh, and a number of other things. So uh, the process should work the same way and it should cover those um, issues as well as um, other issues related to digitization of analog um, and so on. So short answer, yes. So thank you. And I think these are paired questions. So does the December 31st deadline, 20, does the December 31st, 2022 deadline for NARA no longer accepting transfers of permanent or temporary records in analog formats also apply to analog personnel records sent to the National Personnel Records Center? If not, will there be a similar digital 
digital modernization effort for personnel records in the near future. So that is a good question and I'm, I'm not sure how um, we are working internally and with agencies around those records. I think um, there, there's certainly some very specific complex issues around um, personnel records that, that we're going to work through. So we may need to issue some further guidance or have some discussions about those records as well. And I guess this is a, a semi, it sounds like a related, well, here's another question. What are the plans for accepting direct offers after the 2022 deadline in paper from an agency that has already housed them at the FRC? So if this is, so obviously if records are in the FRC system and they're permanent, they would come to us through the annual move, through normal processes, and if they're in our custody, there's no impact. Um, if they are outside our physical custody and within an agency and legal transfer is being made outside of the normal process for the annual move, then that would be affected by uh, M1921 and an exception would be needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, this is an, a, another question that has come in that is uh, putting on your other hat, I guess. Yeah. When does NARA anticipate releasing the final digitization standards? Well, thank you for asking. I was wondering, I probably should have brought that up in the beginning and asked myself that question. Um, our current status with the digitization standards in regulation for permanent records is that we sent it, um, we sent it back to OMB last week. Um, so OMB has had it for one week. We are waiting to see whether OMB would like us to do a third round of agency comment or if they will approve us um, moving forward and posting those regulations on the Federal Register for public comment. So I can't quite answer the when because there's still that key decision. But once we get those regulations posted on the Federal Register, you'll know two things. One, we've begun the 45 day comment period. And two, there'll be a chance to sort of see um, publicly for the first time, which direction we've been going and talking about those digitization regulations. So not knowing the answer to the first question, not knowing how long it will take for the regulations to get posted in the federal register, because you may be aware, those of you who come from the regulations world, that when there, if there's a transition um, of administration, if a new, um, if, if it's not, if it's a one-term president and not a two-term president, there's traditionally a hold put on regulations until um, the new administration takes place. So my answer to the question, when do you anticipate final, would be um, first, a second quarter FY21. So I'm thinking we would hopefully get them posted, get comments out, and then um, between January and March, be able to resolve those comments and get a final. I hope it will be faster if we can if we can move faster. And if we don't, then then that's the time. Thank you for asking, and thank you for letting me explain again our process and the steps. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I think this one is. I'll, I'll direct to Gordon and and Jeff. It's an FRC question. The FY21 cost structure represented a 38% increase for our agency, 52% increase for one center. Did NARA consider going to Congress to explain the COVID impacts and ask for relief, forgiveness of the shortfall, rather than springing in agencies on agencies such an overnight cost increase in a year for which we submitted a budget over a year ago? Thank you for that question. Um, we, um, th th there is, there was a request that went to Congress for relief for the, um, record center program. Um, it was not acted on. Um, I don't know if it's still being considered. Um, the impact of COVID on our revenue is it basically cut, um, our revenue in half. And, 
did not cut any of our expenses at all. Um, so we, we struggled with that internally and in developing the rate structure, we did um, take a look at the impact of, um, of our uh, FY21 estimates for each of our customers and um, we made an attempt to um, balance that, understanding that some customers' invoices would go down and some customers' invoices would go up. Um, it was a challenge because we don't we don't like the idea of bringing that kind of major uh, financial change on anybody, um, and it's disheartening to hear that um, your agency was impacted that that much. Um, what I can offer to you is um, to please contact your customer service representative um, on Gordon's team, and um, I I don't know what. We can do, um, but I know we have had some conversations with other customers um, who are expressing the same concern. Um, so we are uh, working offline on individual uh, cases. Um, in the very least, if what needs to happen is a supplemental budget request uh, to OMB and Congress, we can certainly provide uh, the data and the support that you would need um, to justify that, that request. Um, but I would encourage you to, to go through Gordon's team first um, to see if there's anything that we can do internally. Thanks. I'm waiting to see if any more questions show up. Um, here's one that has come in around annual reporting. Uh, what, what, what or when was the opening date and the closing date for the 2020 annual reporting, RMSA email and SAORM reports. So it's interesting. I'm going to answer that question as best I can um, because it says when was the 2020 reporting? As you know, we're sort of we do our data call and then we look back. So for the year 2020, when we do our annual reporting, we will release that report and we're still planning on running that report um, from January to um, uh, mid-January to mid-March. So we expect to have the reporting window open the way we traditionally have. If you're asking what did we do for the 2019 report in 2020, we issued it in, um, we opened the reporting period mid-January and then due to COVID we gave two extensions so it went through, uh, to, it didn't close until May. Um, so I hope that answers both questions. And what I think you're asking about, so I'll just reframe it again, is if you're asking, will there be a delay for the RMSA reporting period due to COVID in uh, 2020? We are still planning to have a regular reporting cycle with the RMSA, the SAO report, the SAO for records management reports, and the uh, email and electronic permanent records report out in January. And I hope we'll be able to talk about what's coming a little bit more at our December bridge. So stay tuned, follow the blog, follow the, uh, the AC memos that we send out, and we'll provide more information um, soon. Thank you. I'm going to circle back to Marcus. Um, how about one of the, one of the, what is one of the interesting facts that you learned as part of the research into cognitive technologies? Thanks, Aria. Um, yeah, I think the fact that my refrigerator talks to my phone got me thinking that um, <laughs> that there were going to be some records management implications for federal agencies around this. And um, I think what blew me away is just the volume of connected uh, devices and the volume of data that's being generated. Um, you know, there was an estimate there are gonna be 75 billion devices connected to the internet in just four years. Um, and that, for example, um, some airplane uh, engine manufacturers um, now track something like 70 trillion uh, data points per year for their engines. Um, and that, that kind of volume was just kind of a, it's just a different scope uh, than I've kind of traditionally thought about records management. So that was one of the neat things that really came out for me. 
Thanks. Okay, and I'll just point out that we, uh, we you've got a fan already on the YouTube who's going to go read the paper. So that, thank you. Oh, that's great. Uh, this is a, a probably a Lisa question. In light of COVID, in light of the COVID nineteen pandemic, relative to the agency continuity and thereby essential records management, does NARA plan any revised twenty twenty annual reporting? So Gene expanded or new RMSA questions or separate essential records report similar to the e-records and email report. Thank you for the question. And I will admit I was chatting with Don Rosen, our uh, director for oversight reporting, to make sure I had the correct information to give you. And in light of COVID, and again, that's kind of what I wondered if the question, the earlier question was referring to as well. For the 2020 RMSA, in the non-scored questions, we were planning to ask some questions related to COVID and records management. Again, the RMSA is such an important part of feedback for federal records management because it's the data that we learn in the RMSA and these reports help us make determinations on what new training is needed, what new policies are needed. So yes, we are planning to include some COVID questions uh, in the non-scored RMSA port, we also will probably be asking about COVID impact to agency strategic plans for records management, because we know in some areas for uh, analog and digitization, if you're not physically present, that's had a, a harmful effect on what agencies are able to do with records management. And on the other hand, for agencies that have been trying to transition to electronic records, the pandemic ended up being a spur and some plans were put in place uh, to move to electronic faster than the agencies had. So we sort of were going to use the 2020 repair reporting period to learn about the stories and learn about the impact of COVID. So we do plan on doing that. And we, again, to reiterate, we are still planning to have the same reporting period. So we'll be asking from January to mid-January to mid-March. And I'd also want to share, for those of you who are interested, I, I neglected to mention that we did just release the FY9, I'm sorry, the 2019 annual uh, report. We, our federal agency's records management report was put online, and I believe that was just two weeks ago. So you'll be able to read what we learned last year, and that will also help inform the, the questions that we'll be asking next year, or this upcoming year. So, and again, if you have any questions about reporting that I wasn't able to answer, you had something more specific, please send them to me, and I will get the, the right people to send you the right answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Sorry for jumping around, but uh, we've got a very active, vibrant community on chat today. Um, this is a question for Gordon and the FRC folks. Uh, will NARA terminate the COVID-19 surcharge either as a separate charge or baked into a bundled fee once the pandemic ends? Um, Make sure it came off of mute. I am off of mute. The uh, the COVID charge was uh, through September 30th. Uh, we have now, uh, as of October 1st, all of the rates for 2021 are out or have been distributed to customers. Uh, so there is no COVID surcharge uh, baked in. These are the rates for 2021, right? For for fiscal 2021, right now. And I hope I answered that pretty clearly for him. But again, the surcharge ended on September 30th, and now on uh, October 1st, you have new rates, which are for uh, in our new structure for fiscal 2021. Okay, thank you. And here, I think that's. Oh, I have a question on. Technology, what examples, and maybe this is for Marcus, or he can lead the discussion here. What examples of records management processes does NARA see as being amiable to ro robotics, robotic process automation? Wow. Um. Hmm. So the, um, a lot of what we a lot of what we teased out is that um, there is a pretty good records management and data management infrastructure, um, you know, statutes, regulations, policies 
um, that that agencies can fall back on um, as they're thinking about what to do with you know the volume of data and kind of how it impacts their business processes. Um, so I'm not sure specifically about RPA um, and the connection with the records management systems. Marcus, um, this is Lisa. As someone who both read the paper and had the, the, the wonderful opportunity to edit, I'm not the researcher, so Marcus will have to back me up here, but I'd like to answer the question that RPA, robotic processing automation, refers to software. So it's what software tools can be put in place to handle administrative or support the humans who are doing the work of trying to manage records management. So we didn't find too many use cases or examples of RPA being used in agencies for records management, but we think that we saw some cases of RPA being used for broader information management, so answering questions, right, that might be uh, canned questions to an agency records office, that every time somebody sent you a question, there was an automated reply, potentially with more information or examples of, like, these are the types of questions I'm getting as an agency records officer or records program. There might be ways for RPA to help us do better at uh, managing incoming requests and then we're still looking at ways that RPA might help us do better work relating to other areas of records management from creation, maintenance, and uh, disposal. So the widely repetitive tools that can be automated with software is something we're looking forward to seeing, and hopefully we'll have another bridge topic on uh, as, as agencies come forward. So Marcus, I don't know if you want to riff on that, but that's where I would add. No, that's great. I mean, yeah, it would be great if we could create a, a chat bot for records management where people could put in their questions and they could get a chat bot response. So something like that is what I was thinking. Thank you. Yeah, just didn't that our that uh, Marcus, I don't know if you got that RPA chat question off the off the YouTube, but it's it's there. So we've we've captured that. At this point, I'll do a sort of a last call for questions. A uh, reminder: you can still email them or drop them in the chat. We'll take a few moments to see if any come in. So I think we've covered uh, all the ones. Um, I think we'll move it to, I'll start wrapping it up. Uh, thank, since there are no more questions, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for viewing and your active participation in today's bridge meeting. We'll also like to remind you that our next bridge meeting is Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. If you still have questions, please still use that email rm.communications at nara.gov, or visit our bridge page at the URL. Thank you everyone and have a great day.